Hello everyone and welcome to Lunch and Learn. I want to remind everyone that today's Lunch and Learn is sponsored by Daisy and Max Blankfeld in memory of Daisy's mother, Tsipora Burstein Orni, Tsipora Bat Pinchas, and we're very grateful to the Blankfelds for sponsoring today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, now we are ready to, to study uh, Parsha Emor. Just the pages. Which um, hopefully everyone has, uh, hopefully everyone could see in front of them the uh, pages. I'm going to just mute everybody uh, and then I will unmute uh, as we continue and if anyone has any questions. So it's nice to see everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. We have some fascinating material today, which is going to take us in lots of different directions. We're going to talk about the Parsha. We are going to talk about Lagba Omer, which just passed. We are going to talk about Yom Yerushalayim, which is a few weeks away. Some fascinating material, all somehow connected to this week's Parsha. So let's begin. We're going to look at the, uh, the end of Parshat Bahar. This week is a double Parsha, Parshat Behar Chukotai. <clears throat> and we are going to look at the end of Parshat Bahar. And we're going to look at two psukim and to try to understand what they're doing and what their, what their message is. So let's get right to it. Uh, let's see, Colin, I see you there. Can you see the, the, the verses on your screen? Is that clear? Just thumbs up if yes. Yes, great, okay, thank you so much. So we have the psukim here. Lo ta'asu lachem elilim. Hold on one second, we have a question already. Yes. Harry, we're not getting it on the screen. I don't know why that is. Um, it's on my screen. Does everyone else see it? Let me unmute. Other people see it? Yes, Eddie, I can see Glenn. it. Yes. I'm not sure why that is. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, um, okay. Hopefully it'll, it'll we'll get it soon. Okay. So, uh, back to the psukim here. Lo ta'asu lachem elilim u'pesel matzeva lo ta'kimu lachem ve'even maskit lo titnu bi'artzichem lishtachavot alea ki ani Adonai Eloheichem. In English, you shall not make idols for yourselves or set up for yourselves carved images or pillars or place figured stones in your land to worship upon for I am, I am Lord, am your God. And then, et shabtotai tishmoru, keep my, guard my Shabbat u'mikdashi tira'u and venerate my, sanct my sanctuary, I am God. So, um, I'm just going to change this translation. Okay, so the question here that I'd like to discuss is, well, a few things. One is, what do these two psukim have to do with each other? One is about uh, idolatry, and one is about Shabbat and Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. And the other question is, what do these psukim have to do with uh, the rest of the Parsha, with the rest of Parsha Bihar. Because the Bihar uh, is talking about uh, laws of setting up a society. Uh, and so what does this have to do, what do these ritual uh, concerns have to do uh, with, uh, with the rest of the Parsha, and like I said, with each other? Those are the issues, those are the questions that we are concerned with, that we are dealing with uh, dealing with today. Okay, so let's jump into some of the commentary. Uh, we'll look at a few different commentaries, and then we'll move on to some of that other material that I talked about, about Yerushalayim and Lagba Omer and Yom Yerushalayim. So our first commentary comes from the Or HaChayim. And he says, uh, he, 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 he asks a similar question to the one that I asked. Tzarich Ladat, he says, Lama Chazar HaKatuv B'Tziva Kan Al HaShabbat. We have to know, he says, you have to understand, why the Torah, again here, repeats the commandment of Shabbat. We already have the commandment of Shabbat more than once. What's it doing here? What's it adding? So he says as follows. He says that Shabbat is added because we want to attach it to the pasuk that came before it. The pasuk that came before it is a, is a prohibition of idolatry. So he says, 
v'nireshin et kavein lahasmich mitzvat Shabbat lemitzvah shelifaneha, that we are, the Torah wants to write the commandment of Shabbat juxtaposed next to the commandment preceding it, dichtiv lo tasu lachem elilim, not making uh, uh, idols, lomar, to teach us an important lesson. So here, just a general idea, that sometimes <coughs> psukim are juxtaposed, and here the Orachim seems to be telling us something, which at first glance may not be uh, obvious, and that is uh, sometimes the, the Torah will, will, will stick in a pasuk, which doesn't thematically really connect to what's going on, because it wants to relate it to the previous pasuk, not because it's thematically related to the previous pasuk, as you'll see, but in order to teach something else. And what is that something else in this case? Lomar kishem sha'avodah zara shkula Torah, gam mitzvat shabbat shkula kichol ha-Torah kula. Just as abstaining from idolatry is equivalent to observing the entire Torah, so also Shabbat observance is equivalent to observing the entire Torah. That's such a very interesting thing that the Torah says, is, and this is not the only time we see this in rabbinic literature, that doing one mitzvah is equal, it's as if one has fulfilled all of the other a mitzvot. Or uh, we saw this uh, weeks ago when we studied the book of Vayikra, that if you do this specific, specific mitzvah, it's as if you have brought all the karbanot, uh, in the in the Torah. So what's what's going on here? So what, what these these are related to each other, right? Let me let me ask. I'll ask. What why would the Torah be telling us? I'll get to you in a second, Zach. I see you. Why is the Torah telling us uh, that there's this similar idea that if one uh, refrains from idolatry and observes the Shabbat, it's as if they have. Uh, kept the uh, entire Torah. So I see Zach wants to make a point. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, um, I would actually uh, um, expect uh, that uh, or um, Kachayim would say that observation of, uh, of Shabbat, uh, meaning recognition of one maker, compared to first statement that talks about worshipping uh, different idols. We have a complete counterbalance of observation of multiple gods versus to right. one universal power. And this is what Shabbat recognized. And because it's recognition of one maker who actually produced a Torah for us, this is why he, I, I believe, um, making the statement, this is uh, an ob right. observation of, right. of uh, whole Torah. Excellent. Meaning the, the f f refraining from idolatry, which is refraining from the belief that there's more than one God, and observing Shabbat, which is the positive manifestation of the belief in one God. Not only that, and I think this is an important idea, Judaism is not only about believing in one God and refraining from idolatry. It's about believing in one God who did everything. Right. right. Believing in one God who created the world and who continues to operate in the world and continues to have God's finger on how history unfolds uh, in the world. Right. So idolatry is the opposite of Shabbos on, on some level. And so they're juxtaposed here. So since the Torah is telling us about idolatry, it, it also sticks in Shabbat to, uh, to fill out this idea. The way one refrains from living their life in a way which is in opposition to the idea of one God is by refraining from idolatry, and the one one positively lives their life in a way that affirms the belief in one God. And not only the belief in one God, but the belief in the God of history is by observing Shabbat. So that is uh, the Or HaChaim's explanation. It doesn't fully explain how it connects to the previous psukim, but it does explain how it connects, how it connects to each other. Okay, that's, that's a point number one, and I think it's a really nice idea uh, that, uh, that sometimes the Torah adds a pasuk to make a point, and, and this idea of what the Torah is getting at when it says it's as if, right? So it's as if you've done the whole entire Torah because the, 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 the Torah is, 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 is formulated, it's based on the idea of there being one God 
who, who gave us the Torah and who continues to uh, make demands of us. Uh, and that is, uh, that, that's what it means. It's as if one has fulfilled the entire Torah because that's the foundation of the entire Torah. And that gives us the ability and the wherewithal uh, to uh, continue f fulfilling the, uh, the mitzvot. Okay. Uh, so now looking to the uh, Ibn Ezra, <clears throat> the Ibn Ezra offers two suggestions. The first suggestion, he says, you may think you know what the Pasuk is talking about. Seems pretty obvious that the Pasuk, the last Pasuk is talking about Shabbat uh, and the Mikdash, right? Shabbat and the sanctuary. But you really don't know what the Pasuk is talking about, says the Ibn Ezra. And he does this to try to answer the question. He says as follows. Et shabtotai tishmoru. Everyone sees my, my pointer? Et shabtotai tishmoru. The injunction to observe my Sabbath. Shinat hashmita. It's not talking about Shabbat, like the seventh day of the week. It's talking about the sabbatical year. Right? So when it says in, the end, in this pasuk, et shabtotai tishmoru, you shall keep my Sabbath. It doesn't mean the Sabbath day. It means the Sabbath year. Mikdashi tiro, and you shall uh, uh, you shall venerate my sanctuary. That's not talking about the sanctuary building. It's talking about the yovel shnata yovel, the jubilee year. And he says dichtiv kichen katuv because the Torah also refers to this the, the jubilee year as kodesh as holy. So kodesh doesn't when, when the Torah says you shall observe my holy, ho, ho, holies, or my sanctities, it doesn't only refer to the building, it also refers to things which are called holy, and in this case, it's talking about Yovel. So what the, what the Ibn Ezra here is doing something very interesting, because the beginning of the Parsha does talk about Shemitah and Yovel. The beginning of the Parsha does reference the sabbatical year and the jubilee year, and so the Ibn Ezra is saying, we have bookends of the Parsha, the Parsha begins with the, the notion of Shemitah and Yovel, of the sabbatical year and the jubilee year. It ends with a discussion uh, of or a Pasuk about the, 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 the sabbatical year and the jubilee year, Shemitah and Yovel. And that's how he answers the question. It is connected to what came earlier in the Pasuk. It's not, uh, it's, it's not a throwaway. It, it's not misplaced. It makes perfect sense. It's a beautiful interpretation. The challenge is, is that it doesn't seem to be, you know, the most straightforward or obvious understanding, right? The word Shabbat and the word Mikdashi, uh, as the other commentaries suggested, and as we understand at first glance when we read the Pesukim, is in fact talking about Shabbat and is in fact talking about the Beit Dash or the Midrash. So the Ibn Ezra's uh, response, even though it, it helps, it still leaves us with, um, with a challenge that's not quite the most straightforward way to, uh, to read the Pasuk. Okay, so however, the Ibn Ezra himself may have not been satisfied with this answer, and so he offers another answer. Ulafi da'ati, in my opinion, which seems to be, uh, in the language, the opinion that he, uh, the opinion that he, uh, uh, Likes better. Ulafi dati. Shehezkir et shabtotai, bitam, umide shabbat bishabato yavo kobasar lishtaharot lefana. He quotes a pasuk in Nishayahu, a beautiful pasuk, that every Shabbat all flesh shall come to bow to the ground before me. That on Shabbat it was customary to come to the Beit HaMikdash and, and bow to God. And so he continues, keep that in mind, we're bound to God in the Beit HaMidash on Shabbat. Now, once it's we're being reminded, or the Torah tells us uh, that we bow down to, bow down in the Beit HaMidash, which is um, what we're not allowed to do on the, on the figured stone, we're not allowed to bow down on the figured stone, as we see in the Pesukim up above, but we do, do, we do bow down in the Beit HaMikdash. When you come here on Shabbat, like the second, the last Pasuk is saying, that you shall observe my Shabbat, 
by coming to the Beit HaMikdash, umikdashi tirau, and you shall be in awe of my sanctuary. That means you come to bow down on my sanctuary, but not to bow down on, uh, on a stone of Avodazara. And not on that stone, rak al mikdasha, but only on my temple. This is so beautiful. Once the Torah is talking already about the Yom Hanivchar, the, 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 choicest, the choicest day, which is Shabbat, it also mentions the Makom Hanivchar, the choicest place, which is the Beit HaMikdash. So if we go back to the Pesukim, we have a Pasuk warning us against idolatry. And then, instead, the Torah says, instead, how do, how do you worship God if you're not worshiping idols? Oh, every Shabbat, you come to the Beit HaMikdash, which is the first part of the Pasuk, et shabtotai tishmaru, you should observe my Shabbat, and umikdashiti ro, and you venerate my sanctuary by bowing down to me when you get here. Ani Hashem, I am, I am Hashem. So the second explanation of the Ibn Ezra ties us up into a very, very sweet package and tells us that these two psukim are teaching us that uh, the convergence of the choicest day and the choicest place, and that equals the choicest way to serve Hashem, to serve Hashem uh, at the best time in the, in the, excuse me, in the best place. What's, uh, what's, what's interesting, and just something for us to think about, right, is we don't have, um, we don't have the capacity anymore to uh, go to the choicest place, right? We can't go to the Beit HaMikdash. We can go to Israel. We can go to Yushalayim. But we cannot go to the, uh, to the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, so we do not have the ability to combine the choicest place with the choicest time. I thought it was interesting, and I was, as I was learning this, I started thinking about what are the choice, if not the choicest, what are the places that inspire us the most, right? Where do we find that we uh, daven the best? Uh, where do we find inspiration? Where do we go? Where do we look to when we're trying to, uh, to connect to God? The, the, the discussion of the Ibn Ezra about there being choice places to connect to God uh, uh, raises that uh, question, that religious question for us. We do have Shabbat, that's a choice time, uh, but again, we do not have, that's the choicest time, but we do not have the, the best place. Also in this time of Corona and quarantine, um, where we go has been severely limited, even more than it was limited uh, in the uh, beforehand. Uh, and so, so it's also um, an opportune time to think about the meaning of places that we go to, the meaning of places that we're in, what it's going to mean when we're more comfortable leaving the places that we're in and going to other places. Uh, the, this question of, of where we find ourselves and which places uh, in our life are most meaningful to us uh, is really a, a question that's come to the fore during this period of time. And the Ibn Ezra's comments for me highlighted this question even more. Okay, I'm gonna take, um, I'm gonna unmute to see if there are any questions or comments about what we've said so far before we move on to the next uh, group of material. Okay, so everyone is unmuted. Any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. anyone, anyone have a uh, specific, uh, place in their life that's meaningful to them that uh, when you think about or go to uh, helps you create a spiritual experience. Uh, Zach? I just would like to add what you just said, that since we lost our second Beit Hamikdash, we sort of were prepared for a life what we live today in this uh, coronavirus uh, um, pandemic. Because we learn how to create virtual uh, Beit Hamikdash. For the rest of the world, Beit, ha Beit Hamikdash uh, was done. For us, it became number one temporary measure and secondary 
we created virtual uh, um, temple, virtual Beit Hamikdash, which really for us virtual or physical, it's matter of time. We 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 know it will happen. It means that it's happened in our life or in life of our children or life of our grandchildren. We know it happened. This is why we probably easier can live through this uh, confinement. Uh, what we live that in. is so beautiful, Zach. It, 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 Zach, it's so profound. I actually have never heard anyone talk about it in those terms over all the discussions of the corona. Right? What Zach is suggesting is that after the destruction of Beit HaMikdash, the Jewish people had to figure out a way to carry on national life, which was entirely up to that point um, centered around the Beit HaMikdash. And uh, abruptly, we were not able to do that anymore. And instead, we developed tefillah three times a day. We developed the idea of belief in the coming of the Mashiach and the Beit HaMikdash being uh, rebuilt. Uh, we always face Jerusalem uh, when, we, when we pray. We consider our sanctuaries to be a mikdash me'at, uh, a, a, a mini type of the, a mini type of of, uh, of a sanctuary uh, or a sanctuary in uh, a model, a type of a model of a, of a of a sanctuary. So we already have in our national historical record what it means to be exiled from our place and how to replace how to replace what's missing with other meaningful things. Uh, that is really beautiful, Zach. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, bit of, uh, of material. Uh, by the way, Zach, I think that's worthy of writing up in an article. And I have just a place that I think will publish it for you, a journal, an online journal. You make like a two or three page article. I think, they, I think it's, it's really a great idea. So. I don't see you typing yet. Let's go, get going. Okay, if you don't write it, I'm gonna write it and take credit, so you better hurry. Um, okay, so uh, the next commentary uh, is from the Dat Zikanim, also relates to what we were saying before. He says, Et shabtotai tishmoru umikdashi tirau, itkash mikdash lishmirat shabbat. It connects, the uh, Beit HaMikdash to the um, fulfillment, could you still hear me? Uh, connects the um, sanctuary, the temple, to observing the Shabbat. Lomar lecha, ma shmirat Shabbat le'olam, shinemar oti le'olam, just as observing the Shabbat is permanent, as the Torah says, it is a sign for all time. Af more mikdash le'olam. And now we're going to connect to some of the other material. Even the commandment to revere the Beit HaMikdash has no time limit. Sha'af b'chur bano asor Even Even after the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, we are not permitted to enter into that area of the, uh, of the Beit HaMikdash. Okay? So... Uh, that's the juxtaposition of the Psukim. Sh Shabbat is, that's why we have the, both of those things in the one Pasuk. Shabbat is eternal, and the obligation to revere the Beit HaMikdash is also, is also eternal. So this is a really interesting comment in terms of what's the status of the Har Habayit, the Temple Mount, and what's the status of the mitzvot connected to Har Abayit in, a, in our day and age when the Beit HaMikdash has been destroyed. And I want to specifically focus on the mitzvah of Aliyah L'Regel, the mitzvah of going up to Yerushalayim three times a year. We would think, and the reason to go up to Yerushalayim three times a year was to bring the Karbanot, right? Was to bring the sacrifices. So we would think in the absence of the Beit HaMikdash, uh, there are, we can't bring Karbanon anymore, so that mitzvah no longer applies. But I want to show you a few really fascinating sources which seem to indicate uh, otherwise. And we'll also get into some interesting historical things. So not only is this related to Yom Yerushalayim and Lag Ba'omer, it's also related to Shavuos, which is coming up, because Shavuos is one of those festivals where 
when the Beit HaMikdash stood, people would go up to bring the carbonate. So the first source I want to show you is from a tshuva, from a responsa from Rav Shimon ben Samach Duran, known as the Tashbats or the Rashbats. You see his years here. He says uh, something really fascinating. He's talk, first of all, he believes that in our day and age, it is still a mitzvah on Pesach, Shavuot, and Sugot to go to Yerushalayim, to go to the Makom HaMikdash, to go to the place of the Beit HaMikdash. It's still a mitzvah. So anyone who has uh, plans, uh, I doubt anyone has plans for Shavuos. Maybe, maybe for Sukkot, uh, or maybe next Pesach. If anyone has plans to go to Yerushalayim, you should photocopy or print out this Tashbates. And uh, accord, at least according to him, going there is not just uh, fun and a spiritual experience, and also maybe the fulfillment of a mitzvah to Oraita, maybe the fulfillment of a biblical commandment. He says as follows, V'yesh smach v'raya she'kedusha tamikdash v'ha'ir hi kayemet. There is a, 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 a proof that the sanctity of the city still exists. Why? In his day and age, in the Middle Ages, she'adayin heim olim la regel mi mitzrayim v'shar atzot. People from Egypt and other, other places continue to go to Jerusalem during the Shalosh Regalim. He's quoting a whole bunch of Midrashim. I'll, I'll, we'll go to those Midrashim in a moment. He's saying, we know even from the time right after the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, people were still going to, uh, to Yerushalayim. And he says, this is an amazing thing. He says, the miracles that took place in Jerusalem in the time of the Beit HaMikdash still take place in our day and age. So the question is, what miracles uh, is he talking about? So for me, it's the miracle of Pinat HaChumus, which is the best hummus restaurant uh, in the world, right in the heart of the new city of Jerusalem. And that's a modern day miracle. But that's not what uh, he's talking about. He's talking about other miracles. He says as follows. The miracles that took place in Jerusalem still take place. When people used to come to Jerusalem, all of a sudden the population used to swell. It was it, not that many people living in Jerusalem in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, but everyone came from the Shlosh Galim and the, and the population uh, grew and people never said sarli hamakom. People never said it's too crowded here for me, right? Uh, I, I'm going to come. I'm going to come on the off season. It's cheaper to fly and there are more hotel rooms. No one ever said that during the uh, time of the Beit Hamikdash. No one ever said it's too crowded. It's some, some miraculous that Jerusalem seemed to have expanded that it would have enough room for anyone. And listen to what he says. And we also have, by the way, a, a, a mission in Pirkei Avot. I think it's in Pirkei Avot that talks about the Beit HaMikdash itself expanding, that when people would come into the Beit HaMikdash, they would stand up straight and it would be totally crowded, and then it was time for them to bow, and all of a sudden everyone had room to bow, which doesn't make any sense. If it's totally crowded where people are standing and then you have to bow, what happened? So another miracle that all of a sudden there was more room in the Beit HaMikdash. And he says the following, I'm not sure which shul he's talking about, but there is a shul in Yerushalayim, he says, uh, all year long, it's full. And but nonetheless, what happens during the holidays? Three hundred more people show up at the shul, and they they still have enough room. That must be a sign that there's still sanctity there. This is really beautiful. This is a sign of the third redemption, of the coming of the Mashiach, that Yerushalayim uh, is still, or again, uh, the place of miracles, uh, as it was when the Beit HaMikdash stood. So, so we see here uh, some, something that was echoed in the Dat Zikanim. Right, that the sanctity of the place, not just the Temple Mount, but for the for for uh, the the Tashbats, the, the the city itself uh, has sanctity, and there's a mitzvah to go there on the Shadosh Regalim. So that's uh, an interesting source connecting us to Shavuot, and something that hopefully we could look forward to sometime. Uh, 
I want to look now at uh, another source and then the Midrashim that I mentioned earlier. This is from a fascinating uh, book called Har HaKodesh, which was written by Moshe Nachum Shapiro. I was not able to find out much about him on the internet. But this book is a commentary on a well-known book called Pa'at HaShulchan, written by Yisrael Ben Shmuel Ashkenazi Mishklav, Rabbi Shol Mishklav, who was one of the students of the Vilna Gon, who made Aliyah. And he wrote a comment, Rav Moshe Nachum Shapiro, I'm sorry, the, the Pa'at HaShulchan, written by Rabbi Shol of Shklav, is a, essentially, it's a, it's a Shulchan Aruch about the laws of Eretz Yisrael, about, about all the laws pertaining to living in Eretz Yisrael. And Rav Moshe Nachum Shapiro wrote a commentary on that book called Sefer Har HaKodesh. Okay? And so Sefer Har HaKodesh, uh, Rav Nach, Moshe Nachum Shapiro, writes this, like we said before, Gam la'achar ha'churban, churban ha'mikdash, lo pasku ha'yehudim la'alot l'regel u'levaker Even after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, people did not stop going up and visiting there. Kemoshem ruba midrash. And he's going to quote another midrashim. Again, I'm going to get to those uh, in, uh, in a moment. Uh, and then he says, at the very end, uh, the rest is uh, just the, the, uh, all this midrashim. But again, so another source, uh, living in, uh, later, right, than the Tashbats, telling us that people still have a custom to go up to, uh, to Jerusalem. He quotes these uh, number of these midrashim. We'll, I'll just, uh, we'll just, do, um, just do the first one from Shir HaShiram Raba, Ma Yona Zo Af Al Pi Sha'at Notel Gozaleha Mitachteha, just as a dove, even if you take her young birds from beneath her, she never leaves her dove coat. Right? Ein Manachat Shovachal Olam, Kach Yisrael, Af Al Pi Sha'ar Beit HaMikdash, Lo Bitlu Shalosh Regalim B'Shana. The same is with the Jewish people. Even though the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, they never did eliminate the thrice yearly festival, right? They never eliminated going up to Yerushalayim three times a year. And then in Eicha, a very powerful midrash, which I want to mention, because it talks about, at one point, the Jewish people, we'll just do it outside. At one point, the Jewish people used to go up to Jerusalem under the shelter of God, and now we're under the shelter of the Roman emperor. And we used to be able to, when we go, now when we go, they have, uh, they have watchmen on the road, and the watchmen ask us, who, who are you loyal to? And we have to say, we're loyal to the emperor of Rome um, out of fear uh, of, of not being allowed to go. And at one point we were able to go with singing and with dancing and now we have to go silently. At one point I, we were able to go out in the open and now we have to hide it. So I found this midrash powerful for two, way, two, for, for two reasons. One is because it gives us an insight into post-Khurban life, post-destruction life with the Jewish people uh, had to take an loyalty, a loyalty oath, if you will, uh, to the Roman emperor and, and had to um, sort of lie and say that were, they were loyal to the emperor if they wanted to get to Jerusalem. But that's, and that's very sad. But then I started thinking about our situation, right? Compare their situation to our situation, right? We could go up, well, not now, but we were able to and we will be able to, right? Go to Jerusalem uh, with full pride, without having to take a loyalty oath to a foreign government uh, with, with song and with dance and openly without having to, to, uh, to hide it, right? As Yom Yerushalayim is, is, uh, is approaching, we, we should think about this midrash, right? This should be like the anthem for us of Yom Yerushalayim, that this is the way that the Jews lived for thousands and thousands of years until 1967. They were not able to get into Jerusalem unless they uh, either snuck in like it sounds like they're doing here, or were loyal to another kingdom who was in charge of, uh, of Jerusalem. And now, right, look how, the, how history has, has turned around, and now we're back, not exactly like it was when the Beit HaMikdash existed, but very close, right? Very close that we could go to Jerusalem, just like when the Beit HaMikdash existed, we can go to Jerusalem anytime, and I would say that it's easier for us. I would argue the following, maybe it's too much. It's easier for us who live in Houston, Texas in 2020 to get to Jerusalem than it was for someone who lived in Sfat in the time of the Beit HaMikdash to get to Jerusalem. It probably took them days and days and days of walking or traveling on a donkey or a buggy. And in, you know, 
12 hours door to door, we could be at the Kotel. Uh, and we were served meals, we're sitting down. Uh, so, I mean, that's just amazing to think about the change uh, of, of post Khorban to our existence, and even from the time of the Khorban. Of course, we want the Beit HaMikdash, but that's not the, uh, that should not be what stops us from being able to recognize the incredible, com almost complete uh, turnaround of Jewish history that we live in. And it's really highlighted in this Midrash. And now we get to what I think is maybe the most interesting piece of this, connected to Lagba Omer, which we just celebrated, and connected to Yom Yushalayim. In 1837, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, there was a earthquake in Sfat. You, uh, I'm going to just get the uh, wiki page, Wikipedia page. It was actually quite a devastating earthquake. Uh, because uh, the way that things were built, it was very poor. Uh, maybe 4,000 people died, in the, uh, 4,000 Jews died in the, in the, in the Galil uh, alone. It was heard, this earthquake was felt in Lebanon, this earthquake was felt in Syria, and it decimated the Jewish community of Tzfat and Tiveri. Decimated, 1837, okay? You could la later, if you want to read this article, just Google or go to Wikipedia. Uh, Sifad earthquake, and you'll get to the page. Okay, so writing a year after the earthquake is none other than the Chatam Sofer. The Chatam Sofer is one of, if not the leading rabbi of his time. He's living in, uh, in Europe, and you see his years. And he dies two years later, so this is towards the end of his life, but right after the earthquake, he uh, writes a hesped, a eulogy, about uh, what happened there it was a devastating, uh, devastating uh, uh, event in Jewish history. Um, and um, this, this is found, by the way, in his uh, collection of Divrei Torah on the Parsha, right at the end of Parsha, Emor, so close to where we're reading. Uh, and when did, this, uh, what, when did this take place? It took place, uh, I don't have it, I'm looking for a date here. Uh, it says 1837. We don't see the specific date. But anyway, 1837. So this is what the Chatam Sofer writes. Durush hesped almitas tzadikim v'yalchurban eretz ha-galil be'eretz ha This is a, uh, a sermon and a, and a eulogy uh, upon the death of the righteous people and the destruction of the Galilee in the Holy Land. Oh, we have the date here. Shaya b'yom chaf dalad tevi. So we just, uh, you can go to one of those um, websites that do the, uh, the date uh, calculations. On the 24th day of tevi that passed, v'nechrevu ha'i irot, I'm not sure what that word is, v'nehersu ha'batim v'nehergu alfei nefashot Yisrael. It destroyed the, the towns and the houses and killed thousands of Jewish people. Uvahem goane the chachme eretz lorov, and many of them were the great scholars of our time. Venechrevu gimel iroyim, I think, three cities: Svat, Tveria, and Shechem. Right, and so it's just this is a terrible, terrible event. And then again, and now we get into sort of theologically uh, dangerous uh, areas. He he wants to explain why it happened. He wants to explain why. So I'm going to take you off mute for a minute. See if anyone wants to, I know we don't like to do this. Put yourself in the Chatam Sofer shoes. Why do you think, why do you think this happened? Anyone want to be bold enough as to venture a guess? Why do you think that these three cities, Tzfat, Tveria, and Shechem, were utterly destroyed? And by the way, if you read the article, the houses were built on the side of a mountain, on the side of cliffs. And so one house collapsed onto the other one, onto the other one, onto the other one. And it was, and again, construction in that day and age was, uh, was poor. It was a poor, those were poor cities to begin with. Anyone want to venture a guess as to why this happened? Everyone's unmuted. No one is willing to take the bait. All right, smart, smart move everyone. Here we go. Let's go back to uh, the text. So he, he, earlier 
in the in this hesped in this eulogy, he quoted a midrash that said that God sometimes gets angry when Jerusalem is not treated with kavod, when Jerusalem is not treated with honor. So listen to what he says. Key, third word. Everyone see the arrow? Third line where the arrow is. Ki sham shar hashamayim. There, Jerusalem. That is the gate of heaven. Ir shechur bala The place that brings everyone together, all the Jews together, and us with God. Sham har hamoriah. That is where Mount Moriah is. That's where the, the Temple Mount. Akedat Yitzchak. That's where, right, on Har HaMoriah, where the binding of Isaac was. Sham Shachav Yaakov v'chalam lo sulam. That's where Yaakov laid down and had the dream about the ladder. Sham Har Beit Hashem. That's the, the Temple Mount. V'tel Shekol Piyot Alav Ponim. And the mount to where we all face when we daven. And God's presence has never left the Kotel. And no, despite all of that, what's going on? By the way, this is very important travel advice. Next time you go to Yerushalayim, to Israel, after you read this, you're going to think twice of going anywhere first except Yerushalayim. This is very scary stuff. So make sure your travel agent gets a copy of this. Despite the fact that Jerusalem is all these things, he says the Chatan Sofer. It's been almost a hundred years. Samu Pinehem Litzvat. Instead of instead of focusing on Jerusalem, people have have faced, meaning they paid attention to Tzvat. Kisham Kavar Ish Elokim Harashbi. Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, whose yurt site is Lagba Omer. That's where Rav Shimon Bar Yochai is buried. Bimeron, not in Tzvat. I'm sorry, in Meron, near there. The Ha'ari Bitzvat, the great Ari, uh, is in Svat, and those are such holy people, so people want to go to those holy places, and so what were they doing? They were ignoring Jerusalem. The Chol Ha'olim La'eretz Yisrael, Lo Samu Penehem El Svat V'Tiveria. Everyone who went to Israel would ignore Jerusalem, and they would only pay attention to Svat and Tiveria. V'Yerushalayim Nishkecha Legamre. And Yerushalayim was forgotten totally. Who ear shame Hashem Shaman? This is the place where God's name is. Shagambas man hazem mitzvah la lot regel Yerushalayim. Like I said, another the Chatham Sofer saying that even in our day and age, it's a mitzvah to go to Yerushalayim on the regalim. This is a mind blowing source. The Chatham Sofer is saying, I think, the reason why Tzvat and Tiveri were destroyed is because they were starting to usurp Jerusalem as the place that people went to and considered to be holy and important. And so God said, ah, you're forgetting my Jerusalem? And instead, you're pacing importance on Svat and Tiveria? Easy. I'm just going to bring a terrible, terrible earthquake on Jerusalem. So I know that many of you are thinking that this is just awful, that this is a, a, a terrible thing. And I agree. Uh, that's why I think it's very dangerous for anyone, even someone as great as the Chatham Sofer, to get involved in explaining why terrible things happen, because it leaves us with a million questions, right? 4,000 innocent people had to die in Svat and Tiveria because other people, you know, uh, sent their uh, heart, they, when, they, when they came into the, uh, to, to the port, uh, they went uh, to Tzvat instead of to Jerusalem. I know it brings up a million and one questions but it is still nonetheless just fascinating to read uh, how important the Chatham Sofer thought Jerusalem was, right? And how God would um, protect the, the honor of Jerusalem by destroying three other cities in Israel, right? And destroying cities in Israel, we, we cry over that. But nonetheless, that's what he's saying here. It's a, just an amazing source. I put it on Facebook. And I shared it with some friends and opened up a whole discussion about, um, uh, about this very dangerous neighborhood uh, that the Chatham Sofer is entering, about uh, explaining why, why, bad things, uh, why bad things happen. Uh, so that connects to Lagba Omer, because of Roshim Bar Yochai's site. It connects to Shavuot, because we have a mitzvah of Ali Al Regel for Shavuot. It connects to the Parsha, because one of the reasons we saw of the juxtaposition between Shabbat and the Mikdash is to know that just as the holiness of Shabbat is everlasting, 
so is the holiness of of Yerushalayim everlasting. And this very interesting idea that it's possible that when we travel to Jerusalem, at least on the three regalim, on Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, that we're actually fulfilling a mitzvah doraita, uh, which is not something we normally think about. We, we, it's wonderful, we feel holy, uh, but maybe we never thought of it as an actual uh, mitzvah. We do mitzvah when we're there, but just actually getting there or going there would be a mitzvah. That's something we may have not uh, thought of. So that is... Uh, what we have for today. I'll unmute you if anyone has any last comments or questions. Uh, before, before letting you go, I want to remind everyone that this Lunch and Learn was sponsored by Daisy and Max Blankfeld in memory of Daisy's mother, Sipora Burstein Orni, Sipora Bat Pinchas, and they are uh, going to be sponsoring uh, the next, this, this and the next three Lunch and Learns. If anyone would like to sponsor uh, Lunch and Learns in the future or any other program, please let me know. Uh, and if there are no other comments or questions, I'll say uh, goodbye to everyone. It was wonderful to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks bye. for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Nice bye. to see you. Yes, Hannah. Oh, you made it, Hannah. Yeah, I wanted just to say that starting this Saturday night, it will be the most easy thing to get to Jerusalem. They opened the new train, fastest, fastest oh, train. it's open finally. And mm -hmm. Saturday night, they are opening it. It will take between 28 to 30 minutes. Right, to go from, from, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, Aviv right? To Jerusalem. 30 yeah. with a minutes. stop with a stop in the airport right yes for two minutes yes it's amazing like i said in in the time of the beta midash going from tel aviv to jerusalem took a few days right. and now 20 minutes amazing yeah amazing times we live in okay everyone have a wonderful day thanks for sharing Thank that you. Shalom, you. everybody wonderful lesson